I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Robert Kaplan, who's the 13th president of the Dallas Fed. You know, and I spent the last week reading a lot about Robert and, and his work over the past 30 years, and two thoughts came to mind, especially after hearing the political discussion this morning. One was, what's your political affiliation? And two, do you have, what are your plans over the next six months between now and November? Because we could use that type of leadership in, uh, in Washington. And if I had to sum up one word for President Kaplan's work, it would be that, it would be leadership. Robert's private sector background includes 22 years at Goldman Sachs, co-chairing the firm's partnership committee, running numerous businesses, including the firm's all-powerful investment banking and investment management division. In 2006, he left Goldman as a vice chairman and joined Harvard as a professor and associate dean at HBS. He has authored numerous books on leadership, including one that I have begun to read and which I strongly recommend to the audience, titled, What to Ask the Person in the Mirror. President Kaplan uh, served on the boards of numerous companies, including State Street, Harvard Management, and Hydric and Struggles. He was a trustee of the Ford Foundation, chair of the investment committee at Google, and is a board member of the Harvard Medical School. He's act, he is active philanthropically through the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, an organization that invests in nonprofits focused on social issues. And the part that I love, Robert was born and raised in Kansas, where he graduated from the University of Kansas, and then went on to receive his master's degree in business from HBS. So before I turn this over to Professor Reuter, um, I want to share a story about Robert. Um, our firm, we do a lot of business with Goldman. So earlier this week, I reached out to one of the top partners, and I said, can you share a story about Robert that I can talk to the audience? I'm doing this introduction at a conference later this week. So he said, yeah, I've got a, I've got a good one. So in the context, Goldman's senior management training program is called Pine Street. And uh, I've been through it. If uh, you're an MD or a partner, you've been through this uh, first as a attendee, and then they ask you to come back and speak. So this partner said that uh, he had been numerous times to speak at Pine Street, and they get evaluated. And he would ask, so what was my evaluation like? And the instructors would say, amazing. Second best we've ever heard. <laughs> and he heard this three or four times, and finally he asked, OK, you've got to tell me. Who's the best? And they turned around and they said, Robert Kaplan. So thank you for attending and, uh, and for all your comments and thoughts on leadership. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, so I'd, I'd like to um, begin by saying thank you for accepting our invitation. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks we're, for having me. It's good to be in Boston. Very, yeah, I'm sure it is. It's a nice place. Wish here. I had my apartment here. <laughs> <laughs> So um, given what we just heard about you being the single greatest presenter in the history <laughs> yeah. of this program, I true. think that I will probably try to ask you long, open-ended questions okay. so that you uh, are the one speaking instead of me. Uh, to that end, I want to start with something that's, that's maybe a little specific and then open up to something very broad. Okay. So uh, the specific question has to do with uh, Kind of what you do in the Dallas Fed, right? So I know the broad mandate is okay. is employment rates and inflation rates, but you have 1,200 employees in Dallas. Like, yeah, what are you guys doing there? So, uh, so let me step uh, one level up. So there are 12 Fed Federal Reserve banks. So there's 12 districts in the United States. Our district is Texas, parts of New Mexico and Louisiana. Uh, in in we're like many other Feds, of the 1,200 people, probably 300 or so are supervision. So we supervise all the banks uh, or, or work with other institutions to supervise the banks in the region. 
we have a sizable economics department. So we, believe it or not, at the Dallas Fed, we have close to 30 PhD economists, just at the Dallas Fed in the district. We have branch offices in Houston, San Antonio, El Paso, and Dallas, so we keep a lot of cash. And we do services to help serve the banks. And then we do lots of other things along with the other feds. We oversee all the payments in the United States, so I sit on a three-person committee to oversee all payments. So a lot of functions, but the most well-known thing, obviously, the Fed does is supervise financial institutions and monetary policy, do economic research for monetary policy. And we have a big effort, which has probably been accentuated in the last 10 years that all Feds do, to be very actively involved in the community. So in a typical week, I'll be out somewhere in either the state of Texas or in New Mexico or Louisiana speaking or convening Larry Summers talked about education, a conference on education and lagging educational attainment. We take issues, we have the latitude to take issues that um, are relevant to economic conditions in the United States and convene people and do conferences. So that's basically what we do. Very good. All right, so now, now the question that's sort of more in the direction. And, and every Fed president comes together then with the governors to sit on the FOMC. So we the FOMC meets eight, eight times a year, scheduled meeting, we all sit in the meeting, we all play the same role. Uh, and we rotate the voting, but our role in the meeting is basically uh, the same, uh, whether you vote or not. Right, so that, that brings me to the next question. Yep. So w what is your general assessment of the U.S. economy right now? Is right. this FOMC meeting kind of... All right, so let me give you, I'll give you the quickie, uh, the, the quickie tour, which is not gonna be earth shaking. First quarter GDP in the United States was disappointing, which most of you know, or, and I, I should say estimates, because if I've learned anything in this job, unlike businesses, uh, the only thing I know for sure is whatever you think GDP was in the first quarter, it's going to change because it gets revised and gets revised. And we'll know a year from now what GDP was in the first quarter of this year. But the estimates are that it was 1% or less. Despite that, it's still our view at the Dallas Fed, and this is consistent with most forecasts, that GDP growth in the United States will be 2% this year, 2% real. Uh, and the reason we expect it will be stronger than the first quarter was is the strength of the consumer. We think the consumer in the United States is in relatively good shape. Household balance sheets since the Great Recession have improved. Uh, households have deleveraged. The job market is strong. So even though the consumer didn't spend in the first quarter, we think they will in the rest of this year. And so we'll have 2% GDP growth. That's not great GDP growth by historical standards, as Larry Summers was talking about. It's sluggish by historical standards, but it will still be enough to drive down the unemployment rate which is right now at 5%. We think it will go lower during this year. The participation rate, a uh, lot's been said about that. That's another measure of slack. It was 66% in 2007. It's a little under 63% today. And by the way, some of that we think is in fact cyclical, but a great portion of it in our view is demographic. So somebody asked earlier sitting here said, what the heck's happened since 0405? The most powerful driver that's changed is demographics. It's one of the big drivers in that the working age population in this country is getting older. During the 80s and 90s, working age population was going like this. It's now going like this. By the way, it's happening in every advanced economy in the world. But what that does is drive down potential GDP growth. And we'll come back to that. But the point is, there's some room for the participation rate to get a little better, but we think a lot of it is demographic, and so we're not at full employment, we're getting pretty darn close, okay? So that's number one objective. On the third thing, third ish, big issue we look at is inflation. Our, we have a 2% target at the Fed. Um, inflation has been famously running for quite some time well below 2%, but we also look at core inflation. Core means, X out outliers, up and down. And our, everybody's got their own measure of core. We call ours, ours the Dallas trim mean. That's been running consistently since early 2014. Consistently at 1.6, 1.7%. It's ticked up in the last three months to 1.8, 1.9%. This again is you X out the effects of energy and the strong dollar. And that tells us that probably in the next couple, three years, or within that, we're on our way to reaching a 2% inflation objective. Eventually, headline will catch up, of course. So what's that all mean? The punchline, and then I'll get back to some secular issues, 
it's why you're starting to hear people, and I, and I have said, I, I think we are getting to the point where it will make sense to remove some level of accommodation in the near future. What does that mean for me? It doesn't necessarily mean June, it means June, July, we'll have to see, but I'm getting to the point where I'd be advocating that we take an additional step. Now, why is this all so difficult? And we'll get refer to what Larry said this morning. There, I'll, I'll talk about, he calls it secular stagnation, I'd refer to it in a different way. I, and I've talked a lot in my speeches, there are three or four big secular forces, not cyclical, secular forces that, that are creating headwinds for GDP growth. Which is why I've also said, even though we should remove some accommodation in June, July, we should remove accommodation slowly, gradually, patiently, because we, we're dealing with these big secular headwinds. The first is aging demographics. Uh, Larry Summers referred to it, every advanced economy, there isn't an advanced economy in the world I can think of that does not have a problem with aging demographics, i.e. potential workforces are declining. Now that could change, maybe, but he mentioned women entering the workforce, we've already played that one out. People could work longer, although they haven't yet. If you trend this out another 10 years, like to 2024, the participation rate is almost 63 now. Our estimate is going to be below 61 within the next 10 years. This is a huge deal because GDP is made up of the size of the workforce, their income, and then in addition, uh, net change in capital, spent, net capital stock, which has been basically zero, as Larry mentioned, and net change in government spending, which has been basically zero. So it's basically size of the workforce and their income, and what we're seeing is if the workforce is declining, potential GDP is going to decline, and the extreme example of this is Japan, where 10 years ago potential GDP might have been one, one and a half percent, today it's closer to a half a percent or less. That's going to happen here unless we do something, I'll come back to that. So that's number one trend, demographics. Second big trend, I'll do this quickly, is high levels of debt to GDP. And I put it this way, we're at the end of the so-called debt super cycle, i.e. in most of our lives, when we had sluggish growth, we'd have tax policy, you know, investment tax credit, depreciation, other things, government spending that would ramp up GDP. We're at about the end of the road on that. And this is part of that, along with political polarization, is part of the reason why we haven't had much fiscal policy for seven or eight years. And if you add to the amount of debt, debt to GDP in the United States, debt held by the public was 33% of GDP in 2000. Today it's 75% of GDP. Okay, that's before you take into account 40 trillion present value of entitlements, underfunded entitlements. So, and by the way, our budget is in better shape than a lot of other countries. But this is a big issue. Deleveraging or lack of fiscal policy, I think, has created some impediment to better growth. So that's debt to GDP, second big secular force. Third and fourth are well known to you. One is globalization, which we all know about. But what's happening is China is now a much bigger part of the world than it was 10 years ago which means when they slow down, which they are, and they're going through their own demographic problem, a high level of debt to GDP problem, which is getting worse, and they've got an issue where they're making a transition to a consumer-based economy. When they slow, it creates headwinds for us, not just through the uh, trade and, and economic markets, but through the financial markets, which are more interconnected today than they've ever been. And we saw that in January and February, where they devalued, stock markets sold off, and you had an immediate tightening in the United States of financial conditions, which had the effect, if it was allowed to go on longer, would have slowed the economy. And then the fourth big trend, which, we, we, which we've talked about, and you referred to earlier, is I would call historically high rates of disruption. And Amazon, Uber, and the 100 other examples, that are, that are basically disrupting existing models and reducing pricing power of businesses and creating dislocations locally. A lot of people think when they lose their jobs in Ohio or another state, this is trade, it's globalization. Well, some of it is, and some of it is the business, a lot of these industries are getting completely disrupted and they're not gonna get undisrupted. And so those four factors I think are creating some impact on uh, economic growth and, and um, demographics being the most obvious. And so that's a reason why slow, gradual, 
And the, so why, why raise rates at all? Is because running rates this low, and this is where Larry and I might disagree just on the margin, um, there is a cost to, being, to having rates this low. For example, I mentioned aging demographics. People need to save as they head to retirement. Their pension funds need to invest. The, the rates this low creates distortions, which cause people to take more risk because they can't earn on fixed income and other instruments. And there's a cost to that. And I think those costs are much easier to sometimes to see in hindsight than while they're going on. And so that's the reason for the effort to try to normalize. There's just a limit to how fast we can go. So that's a mouthful, but that's basically the broad overview. That was great. Um, OK, so you just outlined four forces that, you know, or headwinds, if we want to say, uh, with respect to US economic growth and, and global growth. Really, you seem you have the tool of, of interest rates, right? And so it doesn't seem that interest rates are inherently going to help us solve demographics. It doesn't seem they're going to help us with globalization. So what is the appropriate scope for uh, monetary policy? So the one thing that I've talked a lot about, and I think it's worth for central bankers to say this as often now as we can, your point is exactly right. Japan's issues, some of the issues I just talked about, are not, uh, monetary policy has a role to play, but they're not going to address these issues. We need structural changes. We need fiscal policy. Uh, we talked earlier today, but I would agree with the, the, the menu, infrastructure spending, um, immigration policy, uh, investment in education are examples, uh, uh, and there are others. Uh, re review, comprehensive review of cost benefit analysis, and a cost benefit analysis for regulation, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level, which is the state and local is just as significant, maybe more so. But all these things are very, need to be looked at in addition to monetary policy. We've gone for seven or eight years where we've sort of accepted paralysis as part of life. In some cases, over the last seven or eight years, we've said maybe it's a good thing there's paralysis. At least, you know, can't do any harm. You know, somebody gets elected, gee, they, you know, what can they do? I think we're at the end of the road on paralysis being a good thing. Because what's happening while we're sitting here is monetary policy isn't going to be fully able to address this. And slow growth is, the, the, what's happening is debt as a result, because of aging, is growing faster every day we're sitting here as long, as long as growth is this low. There is a, the war of 2016 is we've got to grow. And I think we need to broaden the options that policymakers are looking at if we're going to address this. And the time to address it is soon, now. But it's got to it's got to be beyond monetary policy. My own view is, and I said this to you in leading up to this, my only fear for monetary policymakers is, if you try to do too much with monetary policy, um, or we give the impression that this can solve those problems, we may do things actually that could make these problems worse, not better. So I think it's a role now we need to start talking to central bankers about the need for broad policy action. That doesn't mean something will happen. Uh, as I was choking around with somebody over lunch, the difference between a central banker, I think, than, a, uh, than somebody in your job, investor. In your job, and I used to be in your seat, I, in your job, you have to figure out what you think is going to happen and handicap it. My job is a little simpler in a way. I, I have to think about what ought to happen and talk about it and try to act on it when I get around the FOMC <laughs> table. So it's a little bit different. So my job is to talk about what needs to happen. And when it comes to monetary policy, act in a way that's consistent with that. OK. So one, uh, being in Dallas, my brother works for BP. And uh, he, <laughs> yeah, so he um, is working through February, I believe. And then he said, unless oil goes back to $75 a barrel, all of his offshore projects are, are done. Right yeah. um, he said $50 oil would be great, but it wouldn't keep him employed. Right. So you're, you're kind of in the heart of kind of yeah. traditional U.S. oil. So what's your take on the energy sector? So the way, th so at, at 100,000 feet, first thing I'd say, if you step way back, global supply demand, in our view, and we'd spent a lot of time within the industry, and we have our own economists to look at this, we're still oversupplied globally uh, by as much as, believe it or not, a million barrels a day. Now. Um, you would think with all the CapEx cuts in the US and all the pain and suffering, 
that you would have seen global supply start to flatten, but no. And the reason is, as most of you know, any cuts that have occurred in the U.S. have been more than offset by increases in Iran, Russia, and other countries because they're so large relative to the U.S. And in addition, just because you turn off the spigot, it takes a couple of years. People don't just shut down producing wells, they let them run off. Okay, so that's part one. Number two, if you go, I spent a lot of time in the shale industry and looking at the Permian, uh, Barnett, um, Eagleford, it's a, it, it, the energy business I've realized in shale is like a series of, in some cases, out of the money call options. So there are some fields where it is highly economic to produce if prices are $50. But there are other fields that still does not make sense to drill a well if you're at $50. You would take 60, 70, or even $80. And so what your, is it your brother? My brother, yeah. What your brother's referring to is, uh, I still believe that, and we believe at the Dallas Fed, global supply demand will get into some degree of rough balance by the first quarter, first half of 17. Others think it's sooner, we believe first quarter, first half. The fires that are going on in Canada have obviously taken about a million barrels a day offline. And the reason we think, but they'll come back eventually, the reason we think we're gonna get into balance is demand is still growing at about 1.2 million barrels a day. So even if supply just flattens out, demand is gonna eventually catch up and we're gonna get into balance. Uh, and I think therefore price of oil should firm continue to firm over the next two or three years, but it won't keep a number of companies from going bankrupt or failing. And, and by the maybe not even being strategically valuable in a merger, because there's some companies are over leveraged, but they have good properties. There's some companies that are over leveraged and don't have properties that are gonna be viable uh, unless prices go much higher. And I think that still may take a long time. So th this is still gonna be a rough year in Texas, for example in the energy business, but I think globally, um, and as it relates to Texas in 17, 18, and 19, I'm actually pretty optimistic that you're gonna see prices firm, you'll see some stability. It won't be a, it may not be a tailwind, but it'll stop being a headwind that it's been, and it's been a big headwind on Texas. Job growth in Texas was 3.7% in 2014. It'll be something over 1%. They, our best guess now, 1.5% this year. And the only reason Texas has weathered this as well as it has is tremendous migration, continued migration to the state of people and firms in industries away from energy. Energy is now down to 9% of GDP in the state of Texas. That would shock people. Uh, if it, four, it was 14% in just, in just two years ago, 2014. So what's happening is the state's growing in other ways, but this industry has been shrinking and the state's weathered it because of the other, other positive trends. So, so to your forecast for international, or sort of the, the global energy market, so are, are you assuming China kind of stays in its new lower growth rate or, or how sensitive, I'm, obviously it's gonna be- I'm assuming our forecast for China and our estimate, our, 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 uh, our, 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 our expectation on China is what it was at 6.9% down to 6.5, 6.3%, and I'll put reported GDP, but a lot of that is coming from spending and leverage, particularly in state-owned enterprises that already have dramatic overcapacity. So our own estimate is over the next many years, China GDP is gonna continue to ratchet down. They're gonna try to control it and manage it, but the world is gonna have to get used to meaningfully lower levels of GDP growth in China and so even with that, though, back to your question, they're, get, they're doing things to try to emphasize the consumer economy. Even with that growth, we still think it's not unreasonable to expect 1.2 million or more global demand growth uh, for uh, energy in the next few years. That's probably a reasonable base case. Okay, so uh, before doing this, I, I asked a lot of people what sort of questions they would ask you, and then I thought it would be fun to ask the reporters who were here they were yeah. the first people in the That's room. That's always fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and one of the, I, I know, I'm sure you really enjoy their Very first. much. So <laughs> the, the question that's at the top of many people's minds has to do with Brexit and whether yeah. the UK is, is exiting the EU. And if they do, what will the consequences be and, and how are we thinking about that? By we, I mean you. So I'm a central banker, not a psychic. Yeah. So I, I don't know what, I was just, I'm serious, I was just in UK about three weeks ago. And... Uh, 
just reading everything, and, and I, uh, by the way, I talked to the experts when we were at the Bank of England, but I more importantly talked to every waiter, cab driver, people on the street who would talk to me and ask them, what do you plan to do? And what I learned from that, everybody intends to vote. I didn't meet anybody who knew how they were going to vote. And, and basically, it's consistent with the polls. This is too close to call. So the only thing I know I can tell you about Brexit is based on the own work, work we've done, and I know Bank of England has done. So there's, there's some immediate tail risk if they vote to exit, particularly sterling decline. Uh, the estimates, which are their issue over the next 10, 15 years, as people expect some meaningful lower GDP growth. And I've, you've probably seen the same studies I have. For as a central banker to the United States, my, our only, or my only view on this is, it, 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 as we go into the June meeting, June meeting is June 15th, um, Brexit vote is on the 23rd. Only thing I know, we're gonna have to make an assessment on the 15th of what the potential scenarios look like, what's the likely risk. I don't know that that will affect our decision, but it may, and it's certainly a factor I'm gonna wanna look at and I'm sure we're gonna talk about. Uh, and, and I'd say I'm more talking about, I don't know exactly what would happen if they vote to exit and there'll be a two year window transition period, but you, we need to be prepared. There's gonna be some short term disruption particularly in the currency sell-off, which is not priced in, how that might ripple through the markets. I don't know that it will be enough to affect our decision, but it's something we're going to have to look at. Okay. So another question that came up from my colleagues was, what's going on with Greek sovereign debt? Is it, have their problems gone away, or have they just become a less interesting thing for us to focus on? Well, what I've, I've, I've did, I have spent time visiting with the IMF, and the one thing I learned is... Uh, it's not a surprise that you're not hearing a lot about the Greek situation because the IMF, and I think Greece, is very mindful of the fact that Brexit is coming. And if, if Greece you know, becomes, is, is a big issue or, they, they have, or they're at a stalemate, it's not very helpful to the EU. So I don't think it's a surprise that this is, I think you should expect, and it doesn't surprise me, that the Greece, Greek situation is getting very quietly resolved with the IMF. Uh, that doesn't mean the problem solved, no. It means for now, I think they're gonna try to quietly manage this so it doesn't become a factor in the bigger uh, Brexit decision. Very good, all right. So uh, yesterday I was listening to Mitch McConnell on NPR. I apologize for listening to NPR, but I was listening to Mitch McConnell. <laughs> and- NPR is good. Yeah, well, I, I, yes, I like it also. Um, so, <laughs> but I just, I know there are other reporters in the room, that's why I, was, I wanted to apologize. But so the, he, he kind of highlighted some of the numbers that Larry Summers had highlighted earlier about how U.S. GDP was 11% like or so below the pre-crisis forecast. And the issue that he highlighted yesterday was, was regulation, the role of regulation, both banking and non-bank regulation. Yeah. Uh, and he, he was comfortable saying, look, this is the reason that, mm -hmm. that we're not achieving the growth that we, we previously mm -hmm. achieved. And so I'm, I'm curious, given your background in, in industry and academia and, of course, your current role, kind of what's your take on the effect of regulation on, on economic growth, both banking and non-banking. So, in, and as I said earlier, I, I think it would be, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it would be a healthy thing, uh, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, to do periodically a re-review. It would have been a healthy thing, by the way, in 2006, to have done a re-review of regulation to figure out if there was enough regulation, particularly in certain sectors, and I think it's healthy after eight years after the crisis now to do a re-review of regulation, federal, state, and local, to sense what impact it's having on, on uh, new business formation, uh, small business, and job creation. Uh, but I would say the, the, the factors I mentioned about demographics, I'd say demographics for me is the most, is, is, is extremely significant, probably overwhelms but I don't disagree that this should be looked at. In terms of his priority, I don't know if I would agree with that. Uh, very good. Okay, so on a related note, um, too big to fail. So is this, this a distinction that we should be spending as much time worrying about as we worry about, or is there, are there uh, other forms of banking regulation that we, that we should be thinking about? So my own view is uh, the three things I worry about as a, as a regulator, capital, i.e., does the bank have enough, financial institution have enough capital? Does it have enough liquidity, i.e., in a stress scenario? So what's an example? We were talking at lunch about uh, mutual funds that own high-yield debt. Uh, 
in a stress scenario, if they offer daily liquidity and it's a very liquid asset, that doesn't work. There's a, there's a liquidity issue. And then the last is interconnectedness. And so what happened in 08 was it wasn't that AIG was so big, especially AIG financial products, but it was highly interconnected. And so one institution failing could lead to others. When you look at all those three things, that's what the big issues were in 08. Most of the worst practices in those areas were not in the banks. They were in the non-bank financials, okay? Some of them have become banks since, but they were in the non-bank financials. To the point where we forget, the government asked at least two of the largest banks to acquire, or three of them, J.P. Morgan, B of A with Merrill, uh, and then Countrywide, which wasn't at the behest of the government, and Wells Fargo, it asked three of the largest banks to acquire non-bank financials to help shore up these issues. If banks had been a tenth the size in 08, would the crisis have been less bad? No. In my view, it wasn't about size. It was capital, liquidity, interconnectedness, and very poor practices, particularly all this $90 trillion of CDS that created a domino effect. Roll forward, what's happened in the last eight years? We've deleveraged, the, the banks have got much more capital. The, the stress tests have checked whether they work, whether they, are, they have enough liquidity in a downside scenario. And we, we're dealing with, we're not all the way there with interconnectedness. And there's other processes, living wills and other things that are still in process. So I think we're making good progress. Uh, I worry again where the issues are then. I think there's still, I would look more closely at non-bank financials than about the banks. So no. Too big to fail, I think, is not high on my list as one of the top priorities for issues that are facing us right now. Uh, it's not perfect, but I think we're making good progress, and I would, in my thinking, I would put it at a much lower priority in terms of issues that we should be worrying about. It is not obvious to me that we will re would reduce risk breaking up the banks and making them smaller. That's not obvious at all to me, and I think we're making good progress based on the program we have right now. Very good. Um, so, the last question that I, I'm going to ask is, and this is in the spirit of, gr of graduation season, I think is probably what motivated the question that I, I'm going to ask you. So, as an internationally recognized, I know, look at, was, no, we're good. Yeah, no, we're good. Um, as an internationally recognized expert on leadership, I was asked to ask you yeah. what advice you have for the small number of students in the audience, yeah. or more importantly, the parents who will successfully convey this to, okay. to their, uh, their students. So my, my main advice, and this was true when I was teaching, uh, passion is the rocket fuel over time that drives high performance. Meaning, I haven't, met, I haven't met many people yet who excel in what they're doing if they don't really love what they're doing. Eventually they run out of gas. So I think one of your challenges as a student is think through what you love, when were you your best, where did you shine, what tasks do you love, what, what, you know, is it people, is it the mission, is it the ta what is it that you love, and try to fit that with your skills. And the reason I think that's more important than ever is, actually, I, I realize now in hindsight, I graduated from business school in the early 80s. I didn't know this. Demographics were heading the right way. Stock market was going from whatever, the Dow, we didn't even talk about the S&P as much, the Dow was like 1,000, and if I had known it was going to 15,000, the point is, everything was going like this, and so uh, you could have been, done a lot of things and been successful. I don't think we're going to have the benefit of that, people graduating today, which means they're going to get fired more often. They're going to fire people more often. They're going to run businesses they have to downsize or even close up more often than we did. And that's going to require a lot of emotional resiliency. They're going to have to have relationships, talk through more problems. And you can get through it if you love what you're doing. But if you're in a job that you're doing it for the paycheck and you don't love it, uh, going through this is going to be pretty tough. So um, I think the demands on the next generation for resiliency are going to be higher. And I think it's very important. You've got to believe in the mission, what you're doing, or love the people you're working with. You better love what you're doing. A passion will pull you through. So that would be my main advice. That's good. I'm going to go tell my girls when I get home. And okay. They're 9 and 11. They won't listen to me. But, <laughs> um, awesome. All right. So at, at this point, I think we should open it up to questions from the floor. They may be hard hitting than my last question. Uh, yes. Uh, back in the uh, 1980s, we had this notion of uh, rolling recessions where we had some economic weakness, uh, weakness in the middle part of the country. Uh, the Northeast, for example, was fine because we thought the uh, 
the uh, economy up here was well diversified. We found out uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, we might be seeing something similar to that right now where there's a uh, weakness in the energy patch uh, and the Northeast uh, is doing very well. Um, what do you think that the uh, risk is that uh, that could play out again where the weakness could uh, flow this way? Economic weakness could flow this way. Yeah, so I'm thinking. So obviously, listen, there's certain industries that by their nature are a little more geographic. Financial services has, tends to be northeast um, energy you mentioned. And you know, one of the nice things about the Fed, you sit around the table and you got 12 districts and I, get a I give a report on ours and they, I get a report on theirs and then we talk about the country. Um, but I would say based on what I'm seeing now, uh, the thing that strikes me on the flip side is the degree of consistency. There's some variation but by and large, there's not that much geographic variation from what I see. I know, you know Texas has got its issues. Uh, and obviously, if you're in agriculture, Midwest, commodities issue. But otherwise, I see a lot of consistency at the moment. Doesn't mean it'll stay that way. I see a lot of consistency around the country, around a band of economic performance. Now, why is that? Could be, uh, could be a lot of factors, including we're just much more interconnected than we were we're much more service sector oriented than we were. You know, the economy has shifted more. That may be part of it. Globalization might be part of it. But it's something to watch for. Can you talk um, about the productivity of the American market over the last 10 years and where it's going? A little unfair about what we said about that earlier. So back to GDP. So we talk size of the workforce and their income. So productivity shows up in income. And to your point, what we're seeing is Productivity has been, we're not seeing it. So then the question is why? Uh, and there's a lot, and I don't have a brilliant answer, I don't know. When I hear Larry, Sammers, uh, Larry Summers say he doesn't know, that tells me we're in good company, because if somebody would have a view, he, he would. Um, so what are possibilities? A lot of the CapEx and innovation have been in things that don't necessarily enhance productivity. No offense to Facebook, uh, Twitter, et cetera, but I, there's been a debate whether they enhance productivity or detract from it, but they'll set that aside. The other thing in a service-oriented economy with the migration to services, uh, it's harder to measure or generate productivity. The other uh, theory I've heard is aging population means we spend more on experiences and more on healthcare, and those may be harder to generate productivity with. Uh, some of it may be measurement, but uh, we're, re we're wrestling with this right now. Some of it may be lack of capital spending, the fact there hasn't been growth, and laugh at lack of infrastructure spending, which probably is undermining productivity. And I don't have a brilliant answer other than this is something we're looking at very carefully because one of the things that could help us in the midst of aging demographics is a burst of productivity growth. That would help GDP, and we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it. So I think we may need to try some experiments in this country to see if we can to generate it because we're not seeing it. Yes, sir. Um, do you think there's so much intervention that we really don't have market makers? Actually, I, I, don't, I wouldn't go that far. I would say the following. Um, I, would say, the, I, would say the fo I would say it differently. I would say rates being this low. Uh, create distortions in terms of in investment incentives. So I just said, if I'm doing a m normal asset allocation and you look at fixed income, you know, it, 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 it is a natural inclination to want to take more risk. Uh, so it's not that the markets aren't functioning, they are functioning. I think you put the overlay of this level of rates and this level of accommodation, it, it distorts investment, hiring decisions, and other decisions some in ways we can understand, and some, my guess is, we'll see more clearly, in, as I said, in hindsight. But I would put it that way. It's not that we don't have real markets working. Now, some argue during QE, when, QE, when we were building the balance sheet, maybe that was having some effect on distorting, uh, for example, the 10-year Treasury. But QE has basically kept the balance sheet flat, so I, I don't think that it's having, I don't know that it's having that effect anymore. I'd say the same thing about, about Japan. Uh, and again, you'd have to go market by market. You know, you look at liquidity in these markets functioning. Japan, by the way, has got, without going into it, has got a number of unique characteristics. But I would say a lot of the problems you're seeing around the world, Japan being an example, are structural. And negative rates, again, just probably create some incentive, distortion in incentives. 
and investment, but they don't solve these problems. But I don't think they go so far as to undermine that you don't have real markets, but they create, you know, my predecessor used to call this beer glasses. You know, it puts, it, it can distort how you're looking at markets and your, and your decision making. I think that is a fair concern. Rob, thanks so much for coming today. Um, to how would you reconcile Larry's comments from this morning with regard to never a better environment in terms of investing in infrastructure and we're going to pay a lot more for it if we don't right. do it now right. versus current debt to GDP? Uh, so here's the one thing, and, and he alluded to this. So the infrastructure uh, situation might not, uh, it, it, there are options for doing it that might not take that much government money, okay? It will take probably some government money. It might take more inimaginative ways of thinking about public-private partnerships. So I'll just say this was, I'll, I'll speculate on that. Publicly, it was rumored, and I'm not, you know, over the last few years, there was some discussion about, he mentioned it, repatriating overseas money, using some portion of those proceeds to create an infrastructure bank, which might provide some of the equity, along with some government equity, and then you could borrow against that, say, 10 to 1, and you could have several hundred billion capacity to do infrastructure. I don't know if that's the solution, but I don't think, I, I wouldn't assume that infrastructure development in this country would necessarily require just government money. I think there are big pools of capital looking for a place to go, but it probably will require at least a public-private partnership and a little more imagination about how to do it. But I think there are, there are solutions that are there to get this done that may not, uh, that may be manageable in terms of our fiscal situation. But I think it's going to have to be done differently than the way we previously thought about it. Yes, sir. Do you like what you're doing now? Uh, how would you compare it to your Goldman Sachs? Career? Well, so I, I must say I love it. And here's why. So why do I love it? Um, good question. No, here's why I love it. Sir, I've been watching the markets every day. My father's a jewelry salesman, but he and my mom taught me about the markets when I was, I don't know, 10 or 11. And I think after my bar mitzvah, I bought my first stock. I had a few hundred dollars saved. Russell Stover. Uh, I, can, I can say that. Yes, I probably shouldn't even say that. But anyhow, but the point is, I've been watching the markets every day since I was little and reading about all these macro factors, political factors. Uh, and I, that's why I love being in the, um, in the investment banking business. Uh, I love being a professor at Harvard, but I must say, doing the job you have great access. We have to look at everything. I spend every day thinking about trying to understand what's going on in the district, in the nation, and in the world. And that's always been fascinating to me. So in that way, it's the best job in the world. And you can make an impact. And you get to sit around the table and actually make a decision uh, eight times a year. Um, and so it's, it's a fantastic job. And the people are great. And uh, the, the, the people I've met around the Fed, not only in Dallas, but the whole system, their dedication, commitment to the mission, the quality of what they're doing, it's, uh, it, gives you, it gives me great confidence. Uh, and the role of the private sector, by the way, which informs everything we do, gives me a lot more confidence. I'm very impressed with what I've seen so far. So I'll give one example that I've said publicly before, which is, um, which is being addressed. But e here's an example. Uh, let's say there are plus or minus 300 billion of high yield bonds that are held in mutual fund form, or mutual fund and ETF form, but mutual fund form that offer daily liquidity. Um, and if you actually went to sell a substantial amount of these bonds, or even a small amount of these bonds, you'd find out you can't do it. And because of some other changes in the broker-dealer network, which we don't need to go into, there's less, there's less market-making capital, which makes it even harder, lengthens the period. I would call that a, that's a, so the SEC has gotten at it by more uh, capital reserves, and they're aware of this issue, and they're talking about it, but that's a classic mismatch. And those kinds of mismatches, I think, are what we got into, a problem we got into in 08, where there was a mismatch between the nature of the asset and the nature of the capital structure. And I view daily liquidity the same as leverage. You know, now, fortunately, we, man we may manage through this. The energy downturn, I think, highlighted this. 
because high teens percent of the high yield market is energy, and that's what created the strain and they made, created some more redemptions, but what did people, what do these funds do? You sell what's liquid. May not be energy bonds. You sell whatever's liquid, which is why spreads gapped out. And so I, I think that's an inherent instability and that would be an example. Yeah, Mark. Right. The normal post-war economic expansion is, is seven years. And not to say they were on borrowed time because of the, the shallowness of, of the recovery. Yeah. But every day that goes by is a day closer to the next normal cyclical downturn. Given where policy rates are and still the incredible amount of unconventional policies being used, how comfortable are you, or, or maybe how comfortable should we all be as financial Professionals in the toolkit that's still available to counteract the next normal downturn. So, um, the Fed has tools to deal with a downturn, and there's going to be a downturn. By the way, I don't. I don't view our job, or I'll put it from. I don't view my job as a central banker to outlaw the business cycle. You know, it, it's it's to think over the uh, you know ext reasonable period of time. You know, maximize inflation with price stability. Uh, there are tools we have. Uh, we'll have to debate whether it's sensible or not to use them. Uh, but I do believe if there were that situation, uh, I would be advocating we broaden out, again, back to fiscal policy and other policies to address it. it there needs to be more than just monetary policy. So the trap also I'm sensitive to is some people have said, gee, you want to normalize faster so you have more bullets. And I think that, that may be a little bit of a trap in that you want to normalize as fast as you can, but I don't, want to nor I don't want to see us move precipitously where we may actually create the problem we're trying to protect against. We have, we, 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 this job takes patience. Patience is not my forte, by the way, but as a business people, and it's certainly not the forte of a lot of people in the business community, but to be a central banker, I think the intervals between actions are going to be longer than we're used to. And I think we have to adapt to the reality of the world as we see it. But I would prefer we talk about tools more broadly. Uh, it shouldn't be just monetary policy. Uh, and so that's my two cents on that. Yes, sir. How does any new administration impact what you share with them at that point? What are the things that come to mind that you say, we might have to rethink the tools? Yeah. You mean as a Fed? Yeah, as a Fed. I mean, can we have new so, so I've said this explicitly. On the one hand, our job, and I believe my job, is to screen out that there's an election coming and the political elements of it, including political pressure, to just ignore it. Uh, to the extent that the election creates economic uncertainty that causes people to hold off on capex or spending personally, that slows financial or economic conditions, I think we have to take it into account. Um, and I'll stay away from guesses about what the next administration will do, but clearly, depending on what actions they take, for example, if there were more fiscal policy in the future, I think it would give much more latitude likely to the Fed to, for normalization, for example. But we can't prejudge that. We're going to have to see it as it unfolds. Yes? You, you speak about, you look at the shoulds or what could uh, be. Turning to global politics, and specifically South America, and specifically Venezuela, Brazil, and Argentina, the leftist economic models haven't worked too well. And we see what we're, what's happening there. Um, but at the same time, they haven't really looked in the United States whole hog and say, we want to be like the United States. Now, there is a change in Argentina. Um, what kind of economic models do you think they should do that they are more likely to implement if you could give any kind of recommendation? So without talking about them specifically, because I'll, I'll, I'll make these comments relative to emerging markets generally, which include China and Russia and others. Uh, obviously, sound system of laws, sound regulatory framework, sound financial market framework, uh, efforts to eliminate corruption so that you have confidence in the system. Um, 
And I, a third, an independent central bank, I think, has got to be part of the ingredient also, which is, is I think, been key to healthy government. So I, I, w without uh, going into the details on what I see in Brazil and Venezuela, I would say uh, they've all got their, like, for, some are more resource, Venezuela is a good example, very resource dependent, and you would expect they're going to be having some headwinds right now. Setting that aside, I think you want to look at the frameworks for does government effectively work? Does, is there confidence that you have sound economic footing? And do, is there a framework financial market? So for example, when China, which you didn't ask about, had the sell-off and they put on the circuit breakers, you know, it pointed up maybe they need to do more work on more ec policies to have a financial market framework that might allow markets to weather these situations, even though you can't outlaw that you're going to have a downturn, et cetera. So I, I, I would go back to the basics there. And in the, some of those countries, uh, some of those things are not as present as they need to be. Uh, it won't keep them going through financial turmoil, but it certainly makes it more uh, viable for them to weather and manage through those situations. All right, well, on that note, I think that we need to thank you very much thank for you. sharing your views with us. And thank you.